Well, tonight we are going to talk about becoming a balanced parent. Not a balancing parent, but a balanced parent. And um, every one of us has a parenting style, whether you're aware of it or not. And this class on becoming a balanced parent will talk at the will talk about results of lots of research that's been done. Tom, would you mind closing that door, please? On effective and ineffective parenting styles. So, first, let's review if I can find my mouse. I try to get it. There we go. Big idea number six from last week. Because both of the big ideas from last week are really um, relevant to understanding balanced parenting. So, uh, big idea number six, your child has both a strong, steely will, some of them stronger and steelier than others, just by nature and personality, and they also um, have a tender and fragile spirit, even those who have extra strong steely wills have that as well. So your child's spirit needs to be protected and nurtured at the same time that their strong will needs to be shaped and directed and trained. And the big idea connected to this twofold process is that discipline trains the will while protecting the spirit whereas punishment crushes the fragile spirit. And it actually isn't very effective at training the will either. Um, and remember the diff difference between punishment and discipline is primarily the inner motive of the adult who is doing um, the discipline. So, oops, it's probably locked. Tom and Michelle is there. <laughs> Um, discipline is... I think there's plenty others. Oh, yeah, there's plenty others. No, no, no. That, it's good for us all to kind of mix it up. Yeah. So you remember, discipline is motivated by love and is aimed at the good of your child and helping them make future, towards the future, wise choices. Whereas punishment is motivated by negative emotions like anger and frustration, and it's aimed at causing the child to suffer for the past misdeeds that they have done. And um, big idea number seven is pretty self-explanatory by these pictures, huh? All behavior that falls, uh, all behavior that requires parental discipline falls into two categories. And um, understanding this is really helpful too in that area of disciplining the will and training the will while protecting the spirit. And so um, we have the willful defiance of parental authority. And remember that it's not always just what we see on the outside. That, you know, it can be the sweet little one that says, okay, mom, and just doesn't do anything about what you just asked them to do. Um, is this, the, there can be inner defiance as well. Though this is a perfect picture. But childish irresponsibility and immaturity is a whole, just whether we've asked them to do something that's beyond the scope of what they're capable of, or just that they're um, being irresponsible. Now, um, we'll talk about each of these more specifically and the different age groups as we get on uh, it, as we talk about discipline for different ages in the future. But um, helping you understand these are um, helps you protect the spirit while um, training the will. Because if we wait until the teenage years, then that's, we don't want to, I mean, the other, the other little guy, he's almost, See, the borderline is, is he's almost cute, maybe. <laughs> but if we don't do something about that willful defiance, then it turns into this. Or, well, I have to class this, this really, none of you have drivers, you have drivers, but you all will. I don't know, Sam, have you ever done something like this to any kind of a vehicle? 
Uh, actually, as an adult. <laughs> when I was paying for my insurance, <laughs> so it hurt even more. Yes, all of our children, and uh, what, I don't know, don't, it's pretty hard not to go through life without, even poor Tom, he has a short wife who doesn't see over the steering wheel <laughs> And so I've run into park cars. <laughs> Anyway. Do you have any old phone books? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, now, now I fine. have a cushion that I, right? put, I can tell the, my kids, it's my booster seat. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Even though I have a car that raises up pretty high. I'm yeah. just short-bodied, and then I'm short, so yeah, I need that <laughs> okay. So, along with understanding the difference between your child's will and spirit, the, and the two categories that require parental discipline, it's incredibly helpful to know that children are always asking two questions through their behavior. They may not verbalize them, but that, that's what they're asking. Tom's talked about them before. Do you love me, and who is in charge here? And um, so you kind of, they, through the ways they behave, are um, trying to, they want you to answer both of those. For them to feel safe and secure, you need to be saying to them all the time, yes, I love you, and yes, I am in charge here, or we are in charge here. And when that happens, then your child, to be honest, can relax because they can sense that they, um, whether it's their, yes, whether it's their strong will that they need help with, or their big emotions, that you are in charge and that you will help them, or even if it's just their childish irresponsibility and immaturity and they know that they need to be under your protection uh, to make it through life, and frankly, they do. And did any of you pick one of these up? You've got one already? I'll send Ooh, some down yeah. here. Did you get a hold fast? You, but you might not want. I'll send I some both ways. I'm going to read this out loud. because This is an example of these questions being asked by a 13-year-old. Um, hold fast by um, Patty G. Lovell. When our, our second daughter, Kathleen, was 13, that tenuous age where they're crossing into a greater, more control, self-control, and you letting it go. She was as lively as any young teenager could be. Like you will probably be, Miss Addie. Mm -hmm. One night, she excitedly asked permission to buy a leather miniskirt, one like all the other girls in her class were wearing. I don't know, what would it be today? Probably not a leather miniskirt. What are they asking them? I don't know, a mid-drive top. <laughs> Sam's going, I don't want to go. <laughs> As she described the benefits, I could tell she was expecting a negative response. Nonetheless, she acted surprised when I said no. Kathleen then launched into great detail about how she would be the only one in class without a leather miniskirt. I reminded her that my answer was no and explained my reasons. Well, I think you're wrong, she retorted. Wrong or right, I've made the decision. The answer is no. Kathleen stomped off, but quickly turned on her heels. I just want to explain why this is so important to me. I nodded. If I don't have this miniskirt, I'll be left out and all my friends won't like me. No. The answer is no, I quietly repeated. She puffed up like a balloon and played her final card. I thought you loved me, she wailed. I do, but the answer is still no. With that, she whomped, a noise made only by an angry junior high kid trying to get her way. She ran upstairs and slammed her bedroom door. Even though I had won the battle, I felt I was losing the war. I went to the living room and sat down. My husband was working late. I was the only parent on duty. Then one of those unexplainable things happened. An inner voice said to me, hold fast. 
It dawned on me that Kathleen and I were not locked in a battle over a miniskirt, but rather a battle of wills. A mother versus her 13-year-old daughter. Hold fast meant I needed to prevail, even though I couldn't stop my hands from shaking or my stomach from churning. The whomping noise from Kathleen's bedroom started once more, and sure enough, she appeared on the stairwell. This time, she was breathing fire. I thought you taught us we have rights, she screamed. You do have rights. The answer is still no. She wound up again, but I cut her off. Kathleen, I have made my decision. I will not change my mind. And if you say another word about this, you will be severely punished. Now go to bed. She still had a few words left, but she held them in check. She loped off to bed, still seething. I sat on the couch, shaking and upset. None of the children had ever pushed me so far. I leafed through a book, too wound up to go to bed. Just when I thought our skirmishes were over, the sound of whomping came again. Kathleen came down the stairs. Well, she announced, I'm just going to tell you one more time. I met her at the bottom of the step, planted my hands on my hips, and looked her in the eyes. Do not answer, I said. Do not say yes or no. Do not say anything. Do not say yes, ma'am, or no, ma'am. Turn around and go to bed. And do not make a single sound. She slowly turned and trudged upstairs without a word. I dropped to the couch, thoroughly exhausted. For several minutes, I stared into space and wondered what my blood pressure count was. Then I heard her door open. Kathleen, her nose and eyes red from crying, walked down the stairs in pajamas. Curlers were in her hair. That's, that shows how old this was. <laughs> she held out her hands to me. Oh, Mom, I'm sorry. We hugged as she said through her tears. I was so scared. Scared of what? I was scared that you were going to let me win, she sniffed. You were scared that I was going to let you win? I was perplexed for a moment. Then I realized that my daughter had wanted me to win. I had held fast, and she was convinced I had done what a mother needed to do. Her simple words gave me the reassurance I needed. Children love their parents, but they cannot handle being equal with them. Deep down, they do not see themselves as grown up. In fact, they will, if they can get away with it, bring a parent down to their level so that all the family seems like a group of kids. Deep down, teens know they need guidance and leadership. Parents, it's up to us to give it to them. Remember, hold fast. And I printed this out so you can each have a copy because there may be times when you need to, to read it to yourself or read it to each other to remind yourself because um, it is a picture of the true heart of our kids. They need to know that we are big enough to handle their untrained wills and untrained desires and give them the guidance that they need. Okay. For over 50 years, there has been a great deal of research done seeking to discover what kind of parents raise children who have these four characteristics. They started original research back in the 70s, they did new studies and repeated it in the 90s, and they've done more lately, that are all kind of finding out, um, if not these exact, very similar things. And this is um, <coughs> the four characteristics. Children who are happy to be who they are, who have a good self-worth. Children who are respectful and obedient, able to get along with their parents and teachers and class leaders. Children who are likely to follow the religious beliefs and values of their parents. <coughs> and children who are least likely to rebel against values that are accepted as right and good by the established culture. Now, you, our established culture, the culture of the 70s had more of a, an established culture than we do now. Things have gotten harder and harder. It's harder sometimes to draw... Uh, a line between counterculture and uh, and a, 
established culture, but it's really the kind of parents who um, raise children who, who are least likely to rebel against what is generally considered to be right and good. And one researcher, Dr. Baumrind, who is cited in a helpful book called Brain Rules for Baby, found that there are two main dimensions in parenting which greatly impact children. Both of these occur on a continuum from high to low, and these two dimensions are demandingness or control and responsiveness or love. And um, demandingness is the degree to which a parent attempts to exert control over the behavior of their children and are effective in doing so. Um, this is a cartoon um, that shows ineffective control. Uh, the child is actually in control of the adults. So this, um, he's spinning around in a circle singing, some enchanted evening you will meet a stranger. The only way we can keep the baby from crying is if we hold her at a 45 degree angle while hopping clockwise on one foot. <laughs> Which is very silly. Sometimes we do a lot of things to try to keep our babies from crying. But if we advance that too far, that's a problem. Demandingness or control um, can be very much like to the issue of classroom management for a <coughs> teacher. So this is, we tend to think of demandingness as a negative term, but actually it's a term where we're asking our kids to live up to a high standard. Responsiveness is the degree to which parents respond to their children with support and warmth and acceptance. The expressions of love um, that they're giving their kids. And most parents actually do love their kids, but they may not be communicating it in a way that speaks that um, to their children. And then, of course, there are parents who are hostile and, and showing rejection to their kids. But if we're not um, effective at showing our warmth and affection and learning to speak our child's love language, then even our attempts may not speak to their hearts. But... Um, this is a wonderful picture of a, whoop, I went too far, let me go back this way. No, okay, I'm lost. Oh, I went back, <laughs> sorry. Go, now go there, of a mom conveying acceptance and warmth and love. And you know, obviously with kids we can't have every moment that looks like this, but we need to have lots of moments that are showing um, our kids that they're the sparkle in our eyes and how much we love and care for them and conveying them our love in a way that they can understand. So the results of the research can be diagrammed on a graph with four quadrants and to save space um, instead of, we've just used love and control rather than uh, demandingness and responsiveness. So let's start in the upper left corner. A parent who offers high love but low control is permissive or an indulgent parent. And the child of a permissive parent experiences the parent saying, yes, I love you, but no, I am not in charge. You are in charge either because I can't or I won't make you obey. Do you, were any of you here when we read the book about Pig Pig Grows Up? That uh, mom was the poster child for a permissive parent who um, was not willing to make her child obey. Moving to the bottom left corner, a parent who offers both low control and low love is a neglectful parent. And the child experiences the parent saying, no, I don't love you, and no, I'm not in charge. You are on your own. We'll go over these more as in the next few slides, too. In the bottom right corner, we have a parent who offers low love but very high control, and that parent is dominating. It's the authoritarian parent, and the child of a dominating parent experiences the parent saying, no, I don't love you, and you better believe I'm the one who's in charge around here. And finally, in the upper right-hand corner, we come to the balanced or authoritative parent. Oops. And this parent offers both high love and high control. And the child of a balanced parent experiences the parent saying, yes, precious, I love you, and yes, I am the one who is in charge. 
So we'll look more closely at each one. First is, and very few parents fit in just one um, quadrant, but all of us have a tendency towards some more than others. So let's look um, with each style of parenting at what the research found about how kids are impacted. We're going to use a scale up here of one to four, with one being the most desirable. So the permissive parent is too indulgent and too soft. Mm -hmm. And they are parents who truly love their kids, but they have little ability to make or enforce the rules, and they are weak in demanding obedience. They avoid confrontation and seldom demand compliance with family rules. And these parents are often bewildered by the task of raising kids. Um, you know, you might think of the first year classroom teacher right out of school who has a classroom of 30 kids and it's like, how in the world do I uh, keep these kids under control? So the results of this style of parenting, children of permissive parents, score above average. Remember, the um, most desirable is the one. With a two in all four characteristics, they are reasonably happy about who they are, reasonably respectful and obedient, tend to follow their parents' values, and aren't too likely, this is a little confusing, but they aren't too likely to rebel. And this um, Kathy cartoon um, captures one flavor of permissive parenting. And over here, I'll, you just told Gus he couldn't have a cookie. How could you break down and give him cookies? You told Zenith she had to take a bath an hour ago and she hasn't even gotten her socks off yet. You told them absolutely no videos until they cleaned up and they're plopped in the middle of the mess watching videos. They peek around the corner. <coughs> the important thing is we're being consistent. Should we mention bedtime or should we maintain some dignity and just let them stay up? <laughs> so, permissive parents are he headed in a good direction, um, but they're not really sure exactly how to get there or, or they get distracted. <clears throat> now, the neglectful parent, low control and low love, way too aloof from their child. And they may truly love their child, but what they convey is indifference. And they don't try to cor correct their child, but they let him or her do what they want. Um, neglectful parents can be so involved in their own affairs, they give little attention to the child. And the affairs of the parent that consume their focus can be very negative things, like addiction or... Um, dealing with their own dysfunction or wounded heart, or it can be things that look very good, like being consumed by ministry involvement, or even a super clean house, or um, something. It can look pretty on the outside, but if, um, but if it leads to um, neglect of the child because you're so consumed in that other thing, it... Um, it it, it wounds the child. Neglectful parents tend to provide little more than the basic care of food, clothing, and shelter. So it's functional versus substance. Children of neglectful parents often have not been able to accomplish that first maturity task, remember, of being able to receive love and care, which should happen in the first three years of life because that neglect has not allowed love to pour into their little souls and spirits. Neglectful parents don't take time to really listen or encourage their child. They don't see them for who they are as the unique child that God made them to be. And they don't necessarily, the parent, convey interest in the child as a person. And that lack of care and attention breeds bitterness in a child. Um, it, that neglectful parenting really damages a child's spirit. And the children of these parents um, score lowest in happiness with a four. They are below average in respectfulness and following their parents' values, and they are very likely to rebel. Because they see, receive so little care and attention from their parents, 
they become people pleasers and they want to go with a crowd, anybody who will see them and welcome them into that circle. Um, very dangerous in today's world of social media and things if they have um, been experiencing that neglect. They're desperate to find someone who sees them and thinks they're important. And the other thing is, kids who are damaged by neglect, they almost have to rebel because they have to push away from their parent in order to become a, a unique person and find a way to get out of the system where they're being neglected and rebel against it. So a neglectful parent with low control and low love, and this is a cartoon in the New Yorker magazine and um, captures the bottom line of a neglectful parent. The father, the mother's on the couch and the father is standing up telling the two very young children, your mother and I are feeling overwhelmed so you'll have to bring yourselves up. Um, very sad. <laughs> I don't see any of that here. I think you're, you're, you're big enough to take on the challenge with God's help. The dominating parent is like a general. He's that you know, characteristic you know, father. Well, it could be a mother too, father or a mother, who just orders people around and demands uh, explicit obedience. Very authoritarian way too hard in the control they have over their children. And exerting power over their kids, they value that power and control way more than they value having a personal loving relationship um, with their child. Somewhere in them, if it comes from their own child or whatever, they may believe, you know, well, this is a pretty, pretty old saying, but children should be seen and not heard. Um, or, you know, just don't fuss, don't bother me, go away, that kind of thing. And d dominating parents don't try to explain their rules. Do what I say and don't talk back and don't ask questions. And though dominating parents may really love their children, they don't project any emotional warmth to their child. So the child doesn't experience the parent's love. And, of course, especially when they're little, children are often afraid of this dominating parent, and they may buckle under and obey, but as soon as they're able, and they get, then they're, again, they have to rebel because to become their own unique person. Children of this type of parent don't score very well in any of the four categories. Their highest is actually um, a three in being happy to be who they are. I don't necessarily understand all this scoring, but they have done this, and this is. And I'm thinking, is it because the parent demands a lot of for, of them, and so they see that they can accomplish things, and that's why they're happy to be who they are? But anyway, you're looking like you understand this. You get it? No. <laughs> that makes little sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, they get the worst score of all. Um, of all four parenting styles in terms of being respectful and obedient in following their parents' values and in being likely to rebel. Outwardly, they may obey, but inside that resentment and bitterness is building up and when they're old enough, they will rebel um, because they want a chance to become a healthy, independent um, adult. Um, and the very sad thing about that is, especially if a dominating parent comes across as a, a believer, a Christian, their kids are gonna, it's like, you know what? Your God is me. I don't want anything to do with that God. And um, so it's a very hurtful way. And, but this is a little bit of an insight. I'm glad Kathy put this um, cartoon in here because this portrays a helicopter parent as a dominating parent. Um, whether the personal effect of the helicopter parent is sweet, remember that one cartoon we have, oh, take your slip and do this and make sure you don't forget that and that, or harsh and critical, the impact of too much demandingness is that a child doesn't experience being loved well by a parent. And Kathy says this, being smothered by a pillow is just as killing as being punched with a fist. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so sometimes we, again, it can appear that we're being sweet, but if we are trying to over control our child's life, we are being dominating. The balanced 
parent is the only style of parenting that is just right in terms of providing what ch children need. They are authoritative, not authoritarian. Their children respect the authority of their parents and they want to obey because they know their parents love them. Balanced parents, they are demanding of obedience and good behavior. Now again, when we start out when they're little, remember the commanders, and we have to have lots of control, and gradually we are loosening that to their own, but we still have high standards for how they will behave. But at the same time, they convey great love for their children while they're requiring obedience. Balanced parents explain their rules. Parenting takes a lot of talking, and that's good because that's engaging. <laughs> I know sometimes. Now, obviously, sometimes a, a child is like Kathleen in the whole fast story. You need to quit negotiating and 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 cut. But it often, you know, it's like. Who wants to obey the rule if you don't understand it at all? But And so parents actively encourage their kids to express, not disrespectfully, but to respect how they feel about the rules. And um, balanced parents encourage high levels of age-appropriate independence. Um, it's so great for a child to learn to do hard things that they may not think at the beginning they can because it gives them confidence and and so and it encourages them and balanced parents have good com communication <laughs> skills and listen with warmth and interest to their children um, even to preschoolers you know i mean sometimes yes we need to cut it off but you can say tell me you know why don't you want to do that and and we can say you know, or I found it very helpful if I had pushed my kids too far in them being tired or hungry to let them know, I get it, you are hungry and tired, and I'm, I'm sorry it's that way, and we'll try to fix that as soon as possible, but you still need to move this direction or do that, or not hit your brother just because you're hangry. <laughs> um, and uh, you still have to obey, but maybe we can help make some adjustments. Because remember, we talked about it. Even for us, obedience is hard. There's something in us that kind of rises up. And if we can help our parents, um, we uh, need to find ways to help them obey. One verse that I love is Philippians 2.13. It says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Because often we don't ha have the desire or the power, and neither do our kids sometimes. So we need to try to help them learn to obey. And children and balanced parents, score number one in all four characteristics. They are happy about who they are, respectful and obedient, relate well to authority figures and peers, are very likely to follow their parents' values, and are the least likely to <coughs> rebel. And that's what it comes from, and that's research that's been done over 50 years. That, And you may not think that. You know, there's so much emphasis on loving our kids well. But this has shown that it has to be the combination of both requiring obedience and having high expectations at the same time that we um, convey great warmth and, and affection to our kids. Um, because... I mean, isn't this what we long for, for our children? That they'll be happy to be who they are and have good self-worth, respectful and obedient, able to get along uh, in life with employers or parents or teachers, follow the religious beliefs and values of their parents, and least likely to rebel against what's accepted as good and, and right. And, you know, I, and we want to share all we can about Jesus and about God with our kids. Um, again, why would we want to instruct them in how to brush their teeth and make their bed and then just leave God up to this? We want to help them, lead them in that way too. Now I'm going to read, um, have any of you ever read Runaway Bunny? It's a very old book. I'm trying to think, I wonder when the first time it was published. 
I love old books that really are classics because they're good. Be 1942, wow, that's even older than me. <laughs> Significantly older than me. <laughs> um, but this uh, classic children's book is a beautiful picture of balanced parenting. And watch how the little bunny in the story is asking his mother, do you love me? And who's in charge here? And watch how the mother bunny answers <coughs> both, yes. So here we go. Once there was a little buddy who wanted to run away. So he said to his mother, I am running away. If you run away, said his mother, I will run after you, for you are my little bunny. If you run after me, said the little bunny, I will become a fish in a trout stream, and I will swim away from you. If you become a fish in a trout stream, said his mother, I will become a fisherman, and I will fish for you. And uh, this is fun to read with the kids because you can find, like, the carrot in all the different ones, and there's little things to find in the, in the pictures. If you become a fisherman, said the little bunny, I will become a rock on the mountain high above you. If you become a rock on the mountain high above me, said his mother, I will be a mountain climber, and I will climb to where you are. And they, uh, oops, I didn't make it to the... Then they have to find where the little bunny is. If you become a mountain climber, said the little bunny, I will be a crocus in a hidden garden. If you become a crocus, come on, in a hidden garden, said his mother, I will be a gardener and I will find you. If you are a gardener and find me, said the little bunny, I will be a bird and fly away from you. If you become a bird and fly away from me, said his mother, I will be a tree that you come home to. Like the only place to land in silence. <laughs> <laughs> if you become a tree, said the little bunny, I will become a little sailboat and I will sail away from you. If you become a sailboat and sail away from me, said his mother, I will become the wind and blow you where I want you to go. Ooh. If you become the wind and blow me, said the little bunny, I will join a circus and fly away on a flying trapeze. If you go flying on a flying trapeze, said his mother, I will be a tight rope, tight rope walker and I will walk across the air to you. She's a talented mother, is she not? <laughs> if you become a tightrope walker and walk across the air, said the little bunny, I will become a little boy and run into a house. If you become a little boy and run into a house, said the mother bunny, I will become your mother and catch you in my arms and hug you. Shucks, said the bunny. I might just as well stay where I am and be your little bunny. And so he did. Have a carrot, said the mother bunny. And there they are. All nestled in. So, um, this book is also very much like a, a beloved psalm in the Bible. Psalm 139. Listen as I read um, the first 12 verses of Psalm 190. 139, and see if you don't hear this story of the little bunny. And, um, O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up, you would know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. 
to you the night shines bright as day. Can't you see the mother bunny coming in with the big lantern? Darkness and light are the same to you. Um, and so the little bunny, and as we are kind of, as reflected in this psalm, we are asking that question, are you strong enough to come and get me? And the little bunny is saying, do you love me enough to come after me where, wherever I go? So, big, uh, oops, there it was, and I just read it. Well, hopefully you're an auditory learner, <laughs> not a visual one. <laughs> big idea number eight. You can grow and become a balanced parent. And adults who are raised by at least one parent, if you had one parent who conveyed both high love and high control, you kind of have an internal, intrinsic picture of what this looks like. But no one, none of us, functions automatically and all the time as a balanced parent. And so we need to grow in our ability to parent consistently this way. But no matter where you find yourself right now, as you think about it, in the four quadrants, it's totally possible for you to grow so that you are more able to convey to your child, both with your words and your actions, yes, I love you, and yes, I am in charge here. And um, here's a tool for the day, and I think I've shared this one before, that sometimes when they're not bigger than Elias and old enough where they can kind of verbalize with you a little bit, and you, I, when I could tell they were really having trouble obeying, and I would say, who's the boss? Now, they're never, if they're having trouble, going to say, oh, you are. <laughs> they're going to say, God's the boss. <laughs> and, and now here, this is a teachable moment. You say, you're right, he is. And he's the best boss because he's so strong and he's so good and he loves you so much and he knows the future. It is very wise to have God be your boss. But who did God make the boss right now? Dad. <laughs> and who's the boss when Dad's not home? <laughs> and you know, I really did find that sometimes, you know, they're battling. They're having a struggle. To, and if they can just say, you're the boss, it helps them obey too. Can I, there's something magical about it. But, I, and, but use those moments to teach them too that um, now you have to be an example of this, that you're willing to obey God in your life and see that his strength and power and wisdom is what you want to live your life the umbrella under. And the main reason why you can be confident that you can grow and become a balanced parent is because God is the great picture of a balance of control and love. And he, that's the way he parents us. And as his ambassadors, the way he calls us to parent our children. The symbol of the cross of Christ represents these two aspects of God's love. The vertical beam of the cross represents the standards of God's holiness. His character, his goodness, his faithfulness and mercy and kindness and love. And that's the standard by which our behavior and attitudes and motives are measured and judged. And that's, none of us measure up. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of that standard, the glory of God. And But that is the high demandingness, his high standard. But the horizontal beam represents the high love of God. God poured out his merciful and lavish love so that while we were still sinners, we didn't have to measure up, we didn't have to get to a certain place, he sent Jesus to bear the sin of the world. And so for all who ever have or who ever will place their faith in Jesus, um, God the Father can draw us close to heal us and strengthen and empower us with his spirit. Um, to love our kids and to love others um, in, in the way. And our kids need us so much to include both discipline. Discipline is a part of love as we um, relate to them. You know, God says, just like the mother bunny, 
I love you too much to let you live in rebellion. I don't want you to live out of control, so therefore I will pursue you with my love. And there are many ways that we can get lost, and God seeks us no matter what. Um, in Luke chapter 15, uh, wanting to show each person, each lost person, that they matter to him, um, and that God wants them to be back and safe and secure with him, uh, Jesus tells three short stories, three parables, and that all have an allegory or an analogy to teach some truth. First is the lost sheep. Why does a sheep get lost? They're not really being willfully divided. They're just dumb. <laughs> you know, they're, they're immature, irresponsible. It kind of represents that childish immaturity or irresponsibility. And Jesus tells how the shepherd leaves his 99 and goes after that one sheep. And there is such great joy in heaven um, when one sinner is found and repents and returns to God. And then there's the lost coin. Now, that wasn't the coin's fault it got lost. That Somebody else did it to them. And we can think of that like as we talked about type A and B traumas. A traumas absence of good things that should have been had or bad things done to us, be traumas. And the woman in Jesus' story lights a lamp, sweeps the entire house, searches carefully, and as soon as she finds that coin, we don't have any analogy to it today because one coin doesn't mean much to us, but to her that was a lot. And she called her friends and neighbors or, I don't know, Put it out on Facebook, Instagram, I found it. Or like if you lose the diamond out of your way, you know, anyway, that would be a good one. Um, I found it. And then the lost son. That young man was lost because he was willfully defiant. And he went into a dark and dangerous place by his own choice. He rebels against his father, convinced that he's missing out, and he goes off to find his own way of partying and wild living. He doesn't trust that life with his father is good or the best way of living. There's got to be more. So uh, he has lots of friends and party while he has money. But when it runs out, that all disappears. And he finally talks a farmer into letting him feed the pigs. And even the pig food looks good to him. He's so hungry. And all of a sudden, it comes to him through that thick wall of willful defiance. Wow, I had it a lot better back at my father's house. And so he comes to his senses and he goes home. And Luke 15, 10, what a story of God's great love. He returned home to his father and while he was still a long way off, his hey. father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Um, and we talked to, um, earlier about Psalm 107, where people get in trouble all different kinds of ways, some by their own choices or foolishness or um, just life. And do you remember the key line that they said to bring them out of their distress is, Lord, help. They cried in their trouble, and he saved them. And this week, um, I've been reading a book called Imagine Heaven to my 90-year-old uh, mom as she was, no, I'm, I'm going to cry if I say it, <laughs> but it was a good thing. She had uh, advanced dementia. She fell and broke a hip a couple of months ago. She never was able to walk again. She was declining. She was down to 85 pounds. And anyway, she passed away mercifully by the grace of God, sweetly in her sleep this morning at 4 a.m. She went to be with Jesus. But I've been reading this book out loud to her. Um, and it's, it was so amazing and encouraging to me. It's, it's a very biblical Christian man who did um, a lot of research into near-death experiences. Like 3,500 of them. Because there's a lot more now that people like uh, Sam Harvey come along and resuscitate people and bring them back to life. <laughs> So, um, which is not a bad thing. <laughs> but um, there was one in particular that just, it just touched my soul. So I'm going a little over, but I want to read this real quick. Okay. <laughs> okay. Dr. Mary Neal, an orthopedic spine surgeon, was on a whitewater kayak trip in Chile 
when she plunged over a waterfall. The nose of her kayak lodged between two boulders, trapping her beneath a cascading torrent of water. Mary and her boat were completely submerged under 10 feet of rapids. I very quickly knew that I would likely die. Mary told me when I interviewed her about her near-death experience. In spite of the fact that she could feel the intense pressure of the water as she lay bent at the waist over the front of the kayak, her bones breaking and her ligaments tearing, she didn't panic. At that point, I completely surrendered the outcome to God's will. The moment I asked that God's will be done, I was immediately and very physically held up by Christ and reassured that everything would be fine. I grew up in the water. I grew up swimming, boating, doing everything in the water, and I loved the water still, but I always, always feared a drowning death. So, the irony was not lost on me that I was drowning. I always thought that would be a terrible and frightening way to die. Me too. Mm -hmm. But at no point <clears throat> did I ever have fear. I never felt air hunger. I never felt panic. I'm a spine surgeon. I certainly tried to do those things that would free me or free the boat, but I felt great. I felt more alive than I've ever felt. The very moment I turned to him, I was overcome with an absolute feeling of calm, peace, and of the very physical sensation of being held in someone's arms. I knew with absolute certainty that I was being held and comforted by Jesus, which was initially surprising. I'm just an ordinary person. But at the same time, I understood perfectly how Jesus could be there and comforted me and would similarly be present for any other person who called for his help at the same time anywhere in the world. As Jesus held her, well, anyway, she was 14 minutes underwater. Oh, wow. But you have to read the book to hear the rest of that story. <laughs> um, but to me, it was just the moment she cried out to God. And of course, he's there for us. Lord, help. They cried in their trouble. But I just want to encourage you. When your sweet little Maddie is rising up or you're in the midst of something with your sweet daughters or Braxton or your, Elias, he's pretty easy, yet, but, or, you know, <laughs> with, your, with your sweet little Addie, why do we not say, Lord, help? Yeah. Have you ever, you know, like had the lights on in your house early, early in the morning when it's dark? And then the sun comes up, and all of a sudden, you forget that the lights are on because they're so pale in comparison to the sun. Mm -hmm. And when we have the power of the sun at our disposal, why do we insist on doing it on our own? Mm -hmm. So I just want to encourage you. God longs to make you into the noble fathers, noble in goodness and courage, and the beautiful mothers, beautiful in love and kindness. And so... Just ask him for help. And he, he and I, the other thing that encouraged me is, it all tied together. I was reading in the Psalms, Psalm 145, 18. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. He grants the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries for help and rescues them. So let me pray for you today. Lord, I'm just so grateful that... Um, you have blessed um, these noble fathers and beautiful mothers with the children that you have specifically given to them because you knew they would be the right parents for these kids. But Lord, we all know we have deficiencies and places in our hearts that are wounded and ways that we don't do things right. And um, I just pray, give us the wisdom to ask for your help. And then I just thank you so much that you have promised that you're near to us when we call on you for help. And you will give us wisdom when we ask for it. And I just pray your blessing and protection upon each child represented in this room and each father and each mother. And Lord, may your spirit fill our homes with your balanced parenting of both um, love and control. 
In Jesus' name, amen.